Hello, everyone. My name is Ashley Connard, and I'm a board member of the Fulbright Association and serve on the conference committee. I'm pleased to moderate the poster fair number one, Impact of the Pandemic. The conference program committee comprised of five readers who read 137 proposals and made recommendations for inclusion in the program. They were very impressed by the poster proposals and look forward to their presentations. Each poster will get 10 minutes. Uh, each presenter will get 10 minutes to present their poster. And then we will open it up for questions at the end. I'll say one minute for the one minute warning and please post your questions in the Q&A chat box. Lastly, please feel free to share your experience on social media using the hashtag world go from here. So first we will hear from Michael Benavienna. All right, hello everyone. So uh, today I'm gonna to talk about my uh, Fulbright project that was just this last year and uh, the what ended up coming of it. And so uh, I was in India in uh, 2019, 2020, and I was there to study Unani medicine and the Jaipur foot. And so the reasons why I ended up getting into those two subjects was tangential from my uh, research in graduate school when I was in Baltimore, Maryland on uh, Civil War medicine. And so that's a whole nother talk, but the, um, the main reason why I was interested in that is as trying to find this, this imagery to talk about um, uh, this wound in American history that's still unresolved. And so in my, um, research on amputation history, I uh, came across uh, the Rig Veda, which has what is considered to be the first uh, recorded reference to an amputation and a prosthesis. And so I had made this uh, sculpture here, Sawhorse, that was inspired by that story in the Rig, Rig Veda, which is depending on the translation, a horse that was uh, suffered the amputation or a warrior queen. So this was kind of my uh, homage to that. And also on the left here, you see the Jaipur foot, which is this contemporary prosthesis that was invented to be a um, really accessible for uh, all populations in Southeast Asia. And so when I first landed in India, I was um, kind of trying to find my way. And so I started doing these collages in my sketchbook every day. And these were some of them. Uh, I was really inspired by the colors in India, which I will talk more about in one minute. So another thing that I saw was uh, I visited the Indian Spinal Injury Center in Delhi, and I got to see some contemporary prostheses like the Jaipur foot being fabricated. And so these are more collages. So the main three things in India that really were powerful to me was the amount of color that is everywhere. So these roadside stands are everywhere and there's so much color everywhere. And then this concept of Jugad, which is uh, like jerry rigging. So on the left, you see this in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, where I used to live. And then on the right here, this was some guys welding and they just had the welder hooked up right to the fuse box. And so it's just this doing whatever you need to get the job done kind of a, a concept. And so you could see kind of more examples here and these bamboo ladders you see up there on the right were also something that I was really interested in. And um, going back to the 19th century in America, this is when the first patent for a step ladder is. And so that was extremely uh, interesting to see the connections between what I was doing with my own work and then seeing these bamboo ladders everywhere. So Unani medicine, the other reason why I was going to India is this um, contemporary practice traditional med medicine that is uh, derived from the Islamic community there. And it means Greek medicine and it has roots in classical Greek medicine. And so in classical Greek medicine, there are four elements and those four elements, there's four qualities and then there's four humors. 
And so I, when I was at Ibn Sina Academy in Aligarh, which is a uh, kind of museum academy of Unani medicine, I started to try to conceptualize this way of making sculpture that was inspired by these four sets of four. And also just seeing all these really lovely, beautiful illustrations from um, Unani history. And so I ended up trying to come up with this way of making sculpture inspired by these where there were, uh, there's four columns here, each column is its own temperament. So the four temperaments and trying to come up with different materials that uh, can be associated with these four different uh, elements. So brick and things that I was seeing every day. So like brick and um, raw lumber, uh, tires, so <laughs> these were uh, some of my drawings. And so as I'm going around India, I'm also drawing uh, what I see around me. And I'm trying to find a studio space, which was very difficult to, and trying to make sculpture. So I was kind of preparing for that. And I finally get into a studio space and I started to, so one of the classical elements is air. So I was trying to make these like air legs and this air ladder, as you can see over here. And then, um, Around the same time, I'm also, I did this mural with these kids in, in Delhi. This was all drawn out by them and I was just assisting. But again, like all these wonderful colors. And so at this time, I'm just about to start to make some actual sculptures and then uh, the pandemic starts to happen. I end up needing to leave India before I get to really finish my project. And so as I am back in the States and I don't have a studio space, again, that I can make some sculptures with or in, I uh, start to work on this really massive drawing project where I've made about like 70 of these now. And uh, there are some of them like these are uh, kind of plans for actual sculptures, but the other um, half of the project is uh, refining drawings I made of uh, different sites that I visited in India. So here, this is a, a temple in Orcha. And so again, like the color and the density of India is really, was really impactful on my drawing practice. And then this is uh, in Delhi. This is the, one of these big um, observatories from the 19th century or 18th century. And then this was a drawing I did of Goa. And so, yeah, this was uh, overall, <laughs> did not get to actually uh, really work and develop that sculptural practice, but I got to work on all these drawings and I have um, plans to make those sculptures, but also to continue to refine and make these new drawings that I worked on. And so that's all. Thank you. Thank you for presenting your work. That was really incredible. I particularly liked the artwork and how you integrated such vibrant colors that you saw in India. So now we are going to hear from Dr. William Hills and co-presenter Karen Hills. All right, good afternoon. I'm gonna talk, I'm gonna move this over to the other side here. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm gonna talk about uh, virtual communication technologies and where they are today in telehealth service provision. Um, my co-presenter is actually in a telehealth um, conference right now. She provides mental health services virtually and she was doing this prior to the 
um, onset of the pandemic. So her work has seen a tremendous boost during this time. Now, as I'm, I'm sure you know, virtual uh, telehealth is um, you know, offered across time and, and distance. And the direction was already established for this. There have been significant advances in communication technologies. Um, we all have on us a, a phone today that's essentially a computer and has video capabilities and video chats are very common. We're very familiar with this. We're comfortable using this. And many of us use our devices on a daily basis now for such things as shopping and access entertainment. Also, there's some shifts in healthcare toward chronic care. I'm a gerontologist and um, well, long-term care and aging issues are becoming uh, rather prominent, not just here, but you know, there's a global aging process going on too. Uh, for virtual telehealth, once the pandemic hit, uh, there were policy updates within the various disciplines involved and everyone rushed to try to um, work out some of the details for continuing to provide services in a virtual world. So psychiatrists, physicians, psychologists, social workers, and others um, offering typically under the umbrella of, a, of a, an established practice um, have all been approved as providers today and are, and are offering services virtually. Now, there are a couple of options here, just synchronous, which is the most common. It's in-person, real-time, and think video conference, uh, what we're doing today, basically, where you can see someone on a screen, you can provide services um, directly in real time. And then the asynchronous or the automated pre-programmed content, and I put these side by side, so that we can see these. Um, most, most virtual communication of this type is asynchronous now, but about 75% of it's in the fitness world. So a smaller percentage is in the healthcare world um, and it involves such things as uh, remote patient monitoring now um, and store and forward health information that providers have routinely used. For example, if it's very common prior to the pandemic for a radiologist to work remotely and examine an x-ray that someone sent virtually from a, from a doctor's office. Um, well, that sort of thing is happening even within practices in one system or one setting, but also it's happening um, in practices where there are multiple settings and then it's happening between um, providers who are located independently of, of established practices. Uh, the video conference, as I said, is the most common and with audio and video streams, and both of these are being used um, to a much greater extent now that the pandemic has, has moved forward. There are a lot of benefits of this. Um, the idea was that telehealth would be able to reach into underserved areas. There are tremendous urban rural disparities. Um, so there's a, a shortage of well, brick and mortar establishments in rural areas, and there's a shortage of professionals in the rural areas as well. Um, but also too, a benefit is the virtual world now allows an extension of the therapeutic relationship. So we can actually do things that we were not doing before. Uh, another benefit, there's a shortage of providers in most areas. There's, there's just simply not going to be enough physicians, um, Social workers are doing pretty well. There are a lot of social workers, but nonetheless, um, we'll see shortages in all aspects of provision of care. Uh, certainly the mental health world is um, beginning to, to feel the, the shortages. And as a gerontologist, I'm very interested in aging population concerns. As a geriatrician friend of mine told me recently he had gone to a meeting where the talk up until just a couple of years ago had been, we need to convince more people to become interested in geriatrics and, and you know, under the umbrella of gerontology, geriatrics, geriatrics is the medical form. And uh, he told me just recently that the talk now is, it, it's not gonna happen. We're simply not going to be able to interest enough people in geriatrics. And I've seen the same thing in the larger gerontology world. We're just not able to interest students and recruit enough students to fill the, fill the gap. So our models are having to change. And so the pandemic can be seen 
as a benefit in a sense. Obviously, it's a terrible situation, but it has accelerated the use of virtual telehealth care, and it has accelerated the, the shift in our models for how to provide care. Of course, cost is always an issue. Health care costs have been spiraling over the last, um, well, really, couple of decades. The last decade has seen tremendous um, tremendous increases in costs, a lot of it related to technologies. But for clients, they like the virtual health care. It saves them time, um, transportation costs. Uh, it helps them deal better with work schedule conflicts and such things as child care. Providers like the cost control because there's less overhead, right? Less staffing, uh, less physical space. Now, we haven't we're seeing that there's some shifts being made and after the pandemic, everybody will reassess and figure out what worked and what didn't work and then make adjustments accordingly. But we're beginning to see those adjustments being made now. Um, on the right is my co-presenter actually providing a session. By the way, that's not a client. That's uh, one person she's supervising in the video there. So, so we're not violating any confidentiality rules. Um, but that's her gear. You can see a laptop, a tablet, and a couple of phones. And uh, she, I was in Poland in spring of, uh, of 2019, teaching at the Medical University of Lublin. And she was able to go with me and whether she could stay with me was whether she could continue to provide services. And once she hooked everything up and got it adjusted with her IT person back here in South Carolina, um, the, the the presentation and the provision of services was seamless. So that was a real benefit. And so for four, um, four and a half months or so, we were able to not only stay in Lublin, but travel all over uh, Poland, certainly, and then outside of Poland into several additional countries. And she was able to provide services from wherever we are. I'll talk about that in just a moment again. Um, and the costs are, are, found, are seen with, uh, the streamline in maintenance care. And as we've said, the, when there's a shift from acute care to chronic long-term care and maintenance care, which, it, which is handled very well with virtual telehealth. There are other challenges, of course, bandwidth, uh, bandwidth issues. Um, this is not distributed evenly. We have seen this uh, most pronounced with the pandemic and uh, people working from home and, and educating their children at home and how that's become a real issue for bandwidth. Um, so, and that's particularly an issue in direct to consumer where clients are using their own equipment. Um, if they are using some kind of fac uh, facilitated uh, process in a, in, a, in a system that exists, it's not such of an issue, but when we're trying to provide care to people in their homes, it is. Training is involved in education. Uh, an IT specialist is needed. While most of us can operate our smartphones, the type of equipment that's used for healthcare is more sophisticated. And sometimes minute. it takes, yes? One minute. Okay, thank you. And sometimes it takes an IT person um, to, to handle the updates and the, and the troubleshooting, the maintenance issues. Their health literacy issues, the provider issues are, are seen here. Um, licensing, typically that's being worked out. You have to be licensed in the state of the client. Professional boundaries, it's different types of professionals work together, maybe under different practice guidelines. And you can see the other kinds of practice issues that are being taken care of. The ethical issues, whether ethical guidelines can keep up with the technological advances. And of course, we're establishing an empirical basis for Teletechniques, and that's most important. Lastly, um, there is a model for this to work the primary care behavioral health integrated practices, um, where you are providing medical, psychological, and social care in one practice. This is under the direction of the physician, and uh, this is working out, working out very well. So I'll be glad to provide information. We've written on this extensively over the last couple of years, and we have a, an article in press now as an update of this as well. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hills. Mm -hmm. You're welcome.
Your work in telehealth is very important and thank you. I learned a lot from your explanation on the uh, benefits and challenges uh, of the health services, just health services just transitioning to online. So thank you very much. Thank you. Next, next we're going to hear from Dr. Neil Hubin and his co-presenters, Taylor Patterson and Dr. Charlene Collier. Thank you, Ashley. Can you hear me? I can. Excellent. Okay. I'm just going to pull up my PowerPoint here. We still are unable to see your screen. Okay, let's see. I think I'm having a little bit difficulty sharing it. Let me see this. Open system preferences. Would you like us to come back to you? Yeah, we can. We can do that. Give me. Um, yeah, you can move on, and then I'll, I'll try and see if I can get to share. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry about that. So we are going to now hear from Dr. Laura Iremis. Sorry, yeah. Ashley, she, Laura, Laura's having some uh, yeah. Zoom I issues saw. today, so um, we can go on to Olga. Great. Yes, yeah, so Olga um, Litvinova, if you would like to present your work, uh, we are all very excited to hear. Hello. 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 Yes, we hear you. Take it away. I hope you can hear me now because uh, I'm afraid I was having some issues either with the connection or with some Zoom settings. We hear you very well. I wonder if you can see my screen now. We can. Take it away. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. can, you, can you see it now? Yes. Okay, great. So, hello everyone. My name is Olga Litvinova. I come from Voronezh, Russia. I was Fulbright to the United States in 2017 and 2018. I did my research and linguistic department of Montclair State University. So, the topic of my research is exploring post-Fulbright identity by means of storytelling. So, here you can see the outline of my talk briefly, and I'm going to go to the first slide. So what is storytelling? Just before I go into identity and Fulbright, so what is storytelling and what that has on us? So first, it's very ancient kind of art. So that's the way we learn about different civilizations, different peoples, and so on. Of course, uh, then secondly, it has this aesthetic value. We can enjoy beautiful words and writing. And of course, we have different types of storytelling, spoken and written one. And of course, and nowadays with this COVID pandemic, storytelling could be kind of therapy when people can share their stories, their feelings and emotions, and kind of get it off their chest. And of course, now with all this technology taking over our lives, we can enjoy a lot of digital storytelling. So people can find all different platforms for sharing their stories and now it's not only written spoken it's a mix of different uh, different kinds of uh, platforms and so on and of course right now we are presented with different possibilities and challenging so on but right now storytelling has changed so people regardless of all these means they have to tell their stories they might feel disconnected and maybe disengaged with their communities with their local communities and wider communities as well so of course full writers have been engaged in storytelling as well so mostly what you can find is either former full writers sharing tips for prospective full writers how to get a Fulbright scholarship, or you can find Fulbrighters sharing their experiences with blogs, podcasts, YouTube channels. So here on my screen, you can see one of the examples of such many 
platforms like this, for example, here is Fulbright from Ukraine, is amazing blogger sharing her stories. So she shares her story and then she interviews other Fulbrighters. So of course, that's how Fulbrighters engage with each other and wider community as well. And here you can see the example of my own publication of Fulbright blog, because that's one of the largest platforms that we have for connecting with other Fulbrighters and just beyond that. And what about post Fulbright experiences? Because what I found is that most blogs seem to focus either on how to get a Fulbright or how you enjoy your time during Fulbright, but what happens after you go back to your home country. So we don't really know. And what is happening now during COVID when people are faced with all these different challenges of all sorts. Here is an example of how people actually stay connected. So you can see here this blurred image, this screenshot that I took of me trying to connect with a few of my fellow Fulbrighters so we, from Montclair State. So of course, it wasn't really the same. So even though we could see each other on those screens, we felt either way disconnected from each other. Yeah, so what about identity? So why do I want to focus on identity in my project? So of course, uh, identity has been part of different types of uh, studies and by psychology, sometimes they call it ego there, or sociology and philosophy, of course. Yeah, and what kinds of what types of identity are there? So it's national or transnational, so when people are kind of stuck between different identities, cultural, profession, and linguistic. So that's what I'm going to focus on as a linguist and teacher of English. And some people think that when we're speaking another language, like I'm doing now, because my, Russian is my first language, obviously, and now I'm speaking language which is not on my own. So do I feel different, or is, is it kind of me trying to? create a new self in a way. So in linguistics, of course, there have been quite a lot of investigations and studies, especially in the times of post-structuralism. So there has been this growing interest in this kind of philosophical and psychological category. So what linguists, linguists use were mainly autobiographical uh, narratives, written and spoken and semi-structured interviews. Of course, you can see different types of examples that, of such studies. So study broad experience, immigrants, learner identities. So what I mentioned about learners and so fluent speakers of languages kind of recreating and so negotiating their identities, transnational literature and digital text. And what about in identity negotiations by international students and scholars? So what I found during my research, which I'm going to talk about a little bit later, so that all of us, even though we are different, we share something. So we are passionate travelers, we're curious about other cultures. But of course, when we come to, uh, to our host institutions or home countries, we can find some kind of cultural misunderstanding, societal pressures, and as a result, we are faced with a major identity crisis, unfortunately. And what about identity work in Fulbrighter? So of course, we know that one of the motives of Fulbright is that we have to be ambassadors of our home cultures in our host institutions. And of course, in the process, we are being inquisitive, curious, open-minded, and reflective. And of course, we question the status quo. I think that's what all Fulbright, Fulbrighters share. And I think that's what makes all of us great storytellers. And what about COVID? What kind of stories do we have to tell now? So examples of Fulbright blogs, as you can see, there are some people trying to actually write about their identities and trying to explore these issues of post Fulbright identities. So you can see the example, actually, I was a person who inspired this a person named Angela to start his blog and write about that in English, which is also not his first language. And here is an example of my blog. So what I found and I started that back in the United States and now I'm working on continuing. There. What about my experience? So why am I interested in identity? So I did research about writing samples, personality tests, and I, in identity was a topic that wasn't originally part of my original Fulbright proposal, but I found that the topic of identities was emerging in all these interviews that I did when I talked to people about their language learning histories and how they feel switching between languages, cultures, and that's the example of uh, these kind of journalistic projects that I started. It's called Bilinguals. And what about my pilot projects? So now basically what I'm doing uh, today is trying to get people to participate. So it's kind of journalistic, linguistic, ethnographic project. So I try to interview people about their 
experiences with your identities, different types of identities. So hopefully I will be able to elicit some written text, but I rely mostly on spoken text and interviews. So I'm going to use all these different methods. And what I'm trying to find is what type of identities will be most kind of vulnerable to change and how do people feel following their full bright experience? So what I'm trying to achieve here is provide this safe environment for people to connect with each other because I understand that now even though we feel disconnected and sometimes we feel like all our hopes are crashed because I also found myself in this situation I was hoping to maybe continue my research abroad but now I'm stuck in my home country don't know without knowing where I belong. So I found that a lot of us are kind of grappling with this issue. So I thought that would be very safe environment. And I also, ideally, I would like to investigate the language of those texts. So try to analyze the language that Fulbrighters would be using in these interviews and also maybe texts that they are going to write for me, exploring their identity. So first of all, it's going to be a blog or a podcast. So I'm going to work on the same uh, WordPress platform. So I, it will be kind of uh, a journalistic project there and hopefully then I will be able to write some research about that as well so exploring those uh, particular language features that will be used but finally I, I, I hope that there will be some volunteers even though I know that it's, it's not easy to get people to participate because obviously I'm not able to compensate their time so it's just kind of vol mostly on a voluntary basis and I hope that Fulbright is we have a lot of stories to share especially now with this difficult times when people are facing all these different issues and here you can see also my contact and here you can see my references so if you're interested in linguistic research and then down to you're welcome to check out those things yeah and finally thank you very much and i hope that you stay mentally healthy in these crazy times thank you Wow, thank you, Olga. That was really an interesting presentation. I love the Fulbright blog that you have to connect with Fulbrighters. And thank you for sharing that example of yours. I too made uh, one during my Fulbright, but indeed the landscape is extremely different during the pandemic. And so thank you for helping us learn how to stay connected. I'm very interested to hear more about your pilot project when you have some results. And I hope you get volunteers. So attendees, please email Olga. Yeah. So next yeah, we're sure. going to- thank you. Yes, please. Thank you. So next, we're going to hear from Dr. Neil Hubin and his co-presenters, Taylor Patterson and Dr. Charlene Collier. Okay. Sharing it now. Okay. Are you able to see it? Not yet. Yes, we can see your presentation. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Neil Huben. I'm the first year OB-GYN resident at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. Uh, prior to going to medical school, I spent a year in Greece uh, as a Fulbrighter. Uh, today, I want to talk with you a little bit about uh, Black maternal mortality uh, during uh, the pandemic. Uh, black women in America are three to four times more likely to die during childbirth uh, compared to white Americans. And similar to uh, maternal mortality, uh, COVID-19 has been disproportionately affecting uh, our Black uh, uh, community. Uh, with uh, COVID disproportionately affecting Black Americans, the pandemic is uh, likely widening uh, the maternal mortality gap in our country. Uh, the media has uh, covered this uh, fact with numerous stories, and as the media continues to cover it, uh, the general public uh, is becoming more aware of the inequities that uh, Black women face uh, in America. Uh, we believe that it's important for academics and academic communities like Fulbright community to understand and learn from information uh, that's being shared through the media uh, on this topic. Uh, the purpose of our project uh, was to identify themes on Black maternal mortality uh, in the media during COVID and then highlight factors that are likely uh, making uh, uh, this disparity worse uh, during the pandemic. Um, I became interested in, in this topic um, as an ob resident. Um, it, it's something that uh, impacts a lot of the patients that we uh, serve and care uh, for here in Mississippi. Um, so for our project, we explored quotes by patients, family members, and physicians uh, from seven media stories uh, that uh, have been published during the pandemic. Uh, from the quotes, uh, we extracted themes, and then from each quote, uh, we assigned one or two word codes that described the quotes. Uh, and then uh, we took uh, quotes and uh, categorized them into categories, and then uh, from different categories that uh, had uh, related meanings, we 
uh, created theme. So for example, for a quote such as, uh, I'm going to be pressured into certain things, uh, which a, a patient had said in one of the articles about uh, her fear of uh, going to a hospital um, as, a, as a black woman. Um, we, combining that with other quotes, we got a theme that uh, COVID-19 magnifies uh, racial inequities uh, within maternal care. Uh, we also did a literature search just to identify uh, articles within the medical literature uh, that uh, looked at factors that are uh, making uh, uh, maternal mortality potentially uh, worse uh, for uh, our uh, Black community. So uh, for our results, um, we extracted uh, 58 quotes from the seven media stories. Um, those 58 quotes were from patients, family members, and physicians. There were, there were also quotes from, from midwives, doulas, and um, um, uh, other uh, individuals. Um, and then from our online database, we uh, got uh, seven articles within the, within the medical literature that's been published since um, January uh, of this year that discuss factors that are exacerbating disparities uh, for Black mothers uh, during COVID-19. Um, kind of for the sake of time, I'm just gonna highlight uh, some, of, uh, some of the quotes and talk about how some of these quotes came together uh, to highlight a, a theme uh, that is um, uh, within the, the current uh, uh, stories from the media. Uh, so on the left here, hospitals are not safe uh, for black women um, or uh, please don't let them kill me. These are quotes uh, from stories in which uh, women were expressing their fears of, of going to the hospital. Um, another one is, uh, another lady had said, uh, it was really lonely having to go through the longer appointments and testing without him. Uh, due to COVID, uh, most clinics have restricted uh, prenatal visits to just the mother and she's not able to bring her, her partner or family member. And, and that's uh, resulted in, in uh, having to go through uh, pregnancy, uh, a lot of these things alone. Um, another quote is, I I've learned how to advocate for myself, but sometimes I don't want to have to be strong. And it's kind of a reoccurring theme with, within the media stories that um, a lot of, uh, of our African-American women feel that they have to advocate um, in the hospital uh, for providers to listen to them. Um, instead of having to just focus on being cared for, they have to make sure that, uh, that, uh, uh, that they're being uh, treated appropriately. Uh, so combining these, these quotes, we came up with the theme that the emotional impact of COVID-19 and fears of the healthcare system um, are playing a role in, in shaping uh, what it means to be black and pregnant um, during uh, this year and during the pandemic. Um, some other quotes from, from patients here, uh, friends uh, kept telling me that when you're a black woman, you really have to find a way to get people to listen to you when you're in pain. And we, we saw this a couple of years ago with uh, Serena Williams uh, after she delivered and she delivered uh, and had blood clots in her lungs and uh, due to coughing, she ended up having the incision along her uterus uh, that she had for her C-section uh, uh, come open and, and she was complaining of pain for quite a while before they actually took a look at imaging her. Um, another quote is, I felt like I needed to have my hand held uh, this pregnancy, but they never had time to see me. Uh, this was uh, from a story about a, a mom uh, during the pandemic who was having twins and a complicated pregnancy. And she, she was feeling that because of uh, how rushed everything was within the clinic and how, um, how everything has kind of moved along because of uh, social distancing that she wasn't able to be uh, cared for in the way that she uh, felt that she should have been. And so this, this theme, these quotes, um, along with other quotes, uh, built the theme that COVID-19 has been magnifying uh, racial inequities uh, within maternal care. Uh, we have some quotes from family members. Uh, some of these quotes include, uh, all I could see on the camera's uh, screen were white walls and ceilings in the ceiling of the room. Um, for a lot of the pandemic, most labor and delivery units um, haven't allowed family members to be with laboring moms. So that's a sense changed, but there was uh, several months in which moms were delivering by themselves and their family members uh, were uh, having to rely on Skype or, or Zoom to be a part of it. And so this quote was from a, a, a male partner as he was um, witnessing his, his uh, a wife uh, give birth uh, over, over Skype. Um, so these and other quotes uh, came up with the theme from family members in the media that COVID-19 has really impacted their ability uh, to support their pregnant Black mothers uh, during the pregnancy process and as well as during labor. Uh, we have some quotes from uh, physicians. Um, some of these quotes that I've got highlighted here in green include, uh, Black birthing people are already more likely to die uh, regardless of their income or education. And things that we already know prior to COVID uh, is that um, if you have uh, a black woman who is uh, 
has, has a graduate degree, um, she's still more likely uh, to uh, die during childbirth uh, compared to uh, a white woman who uh, lives below the poverty line and hasn't graduated high school. So uh, the disparities are, are quite are quite large. Um, the other another quote is America has the worst maternal health problems in the developed world, and there's no way to to really understand this without putting uh, racism at the front and center uh, of of what's going on. And so these themes uh, from position quotes in the media, uh, or these quotes uh, from positions in the media, really kind of uh, underscore the theme that systemic racism and health inequities uh, underlie black maternal mortality rates uh, in our country. Um, some Last few uh, quotes from physicians include, uh, women fear that they're uh, asymptomatic with COVID and will be separated from their baby. And that's, that's something that I've, I've seen just this week um, for moms who, who come in uh, and test positive for COVID but don't know they have it. Uh, they have to be separated uh, from their babies uh, for, for a period of 10 days. And that's something that, that moms are fearing. Um, another quote is, uh, we don't know how many are out there uh, who are not coming in or who are missing appointments because of this. And this was a physician talking about uh, the fear that COVID has uh, um, caused some women to not seek out prenatal care. And we certainly uh, on, a, on a weekly basis see uh, women show up uh, in labor without any prenatal care. And it'll, it'll be interesting to see if, if uh, that frequency has increased as a result of the pandemic. And then a, a last quote from a physician was that some people are choosing to bring their doula with them to the hospital uh, and FaceTiming their partner. So most hospitals right now just allow uh, one family member or support person with mom while she delivers. And this isn't so much in Mississippi, but in other parts of the country, uh, some, some uh, black women have uh, chose to bring a, a doula or support person to make sure that someone's advocating for them and, and for their safety and for their baby uh, while they're at the hospital uh, delivering. Um, for the academic literature, um, we uh, looked at seven articles and there was multiple factors uh, that these articles talked about that are exacerbating uh, maternal health uh, within uh, our country. Um, one such factor is the limited ability to practice uh, risk-reducing behaviors. Um, other factors include a uh, higher prevalence of chronic medical conditions. Um, to say something about that, like for, for example, asthma. Um, asthma isn't uh, equally uh, distributed throughout throughout the country. It's oftentimes in, in communities with pollutants and oftentimes uh, women of color live within those communities. Um, just to kind of skip through uh, these exacerbating factors, uh, also include things like mistrust of the healthcare system and, and uh, communities that are um, potentially underinsured or uh, have had negative experiences with the health healthcare system uh, may be less likely to um, pursue care even if they are, are symptomatic uh, during COVID. So, so uh, in conclusion, uh, both COVID-19 and maternal mortality disparities uh, affect uh, Black Americans. And uh, even though uh, SARS uh, can impact uh, our Black women by directly uh, affecting them with the virus, there's, there's uh, other ways that it's also impacting them. And the majority of uh, maternal health disparities in our country uh, stem from factors that originate outside the hospital. They are factors that originate uh, in the community. And media stories from COVID-19 highlighting uh, Black maternal health in inequities during the pandemic, along with uh, the factors that are listed in the academic literature, shed light uh, on issues that are contributing to Black maternal outcomes. Um, this bottom quote here, I just listened to the patient. She will tell you the diagnosis is a quote uh, from William Mosler. He's uh, considered to be the, the founder of modern medicine. And I, I think it's more true now than ever um, to, to listen to our, our black mothers and to our black community and, and hear what they're saying because a lot of the issues that are being uh, addressed right now uh, or brought up in the public are, are factors that truly uh, are impacting our, our black mothers and, and their well being. Um, so that's that's uh, our presentation. Um, thank you for letting us uh, talk with you about um, Black maternal mortality. Thank you so much for your very important work and research and sharing that with us. These stories and themes are obviously extremely vital to help us combat high Black maternal mortality rates during this pandemic and in other contexts. So thank you very much. Next, we are going to hear from Jenna Reynolds and co-presenter Anne Varnado. And everyone who is attending, so there are 74 of us, please post questions because this is extremely interesting and I know some of you must have itching questions. Well, you can post them. We will get to those at the end after this presentation. Thank you.
Thank you, Ashley. Um, so today, Anne and I are going to present about virtual storytelling, the cross-cultural impact of shared micro-histories in digital classrooms, and I'm Jenna Reynolds. And I'm Anne Barnado. And I was a Fulbright to Spain, a Fulbright ETA from 2015 to 2016. Um, and this presentation has to do with um, the transition from in-person learning to virtual learning this past spring when I taught at the University of Alabama in my Spanish civilization course, um, which I approach decolonially um, and really emphasize representing immigrant voices, native Spaniards, and colonized populations as well. And um, as it pertains to my work, I'm currently working in a um, public school as a world history teacher. Um, so focusing on decolonizing that history and what it looks like to decenter whiteness in the classroom, um, especially as white educators and thinking about how to represent multicultural perspectives that re represent our students' identities as well. And we really wanted to talk about how we implemented these practices in person and also in the virtual classroom and how that has afforded us an extra chance to kind of highlight these voices through engaging in relevant multimedia resources and different digital platforms, um, largely by video. And lastly, um, focusing on the importance of making our students understand there's not just one hegemonic perspective um, and that we as educators are not the arbiters of one narrative. Um, so decenting ourselves in the classroom um, and letting students see that stories and perspective um, is very important in gaining a nuanced viewpoint. And so I'll talk first about um, my course in the spring of 2020. Um, the university went virtual in March. And so the course that I was teaching um, was to university level Spanish students, and it's their first formal introduction to Spanish culture, politics, and history. It's a Spanish civilization course. And we largely explore um, the question, what is Spain and what does it mean to be Spanish, as well as what do Spain and its history and people actually look like? Um, not what we think or what, what we already know, but what it actually is. Um, and so I really want the students to take from this course the significance of analyzing Spain's global role as well as its relations with the United States um, and its role in colonization, which is substantial, so that they can reach a multifaceted and deeper understanding of current politics and the state of affairs. And so what I did was invited nine speakers um, to my classroom and some of them were native Spaniards, some were prior students of mine from my Fulbright. Um, and some were immigrants, um, some were other Fulbrighters who had lived in Spain or who were living in Spain at the moment and were quarantining. Um, and so all of these videos are made in quarantine um, and they were on different relevant cultural and political topics, things like immigration, public health, um, and the topics of public health and domestic violence were very specifically contextualized for my students by my speakers um, in terms of the COVID-19 pandemic. And so they really got to see um, what it looked like to quarantine in Spain um, and how similar it looked to quarantine in the United States, um, although there were some salient differences as well. Um, and so my students had a chance to kind of understand all of these new topics that we were exploring in the context of a pandemic as well. Um, and it helped them understand the personal nature of politics um, by hearing these stories from these people. And below are some screenshots from the videos that, that we shared. I'm sure at this point we've all experienced to some extent Zoom meetings with pets and people in their homes and really seeing how much we actually have in common and how many bridges there are between us rather than differences. Um, and so it really helped my students understand how personal politics and current events and history really are um, so that they could reach a better understanding of Spain's positionality um, and understand that history and all the information we're learning in the classroom has a role in the actual world. So I really used virtual storytelling as a way to present information and help students kind of build these bridges between shared history and then the issues um, for the US and Spain so that they can reach this kind of comparative contextualization of each theme. And so my students had a chance to kind of interact with each of the speakers um, and ask them questions and really just kind of dive into the micro level of the history that we were learning. 
And then in terms of my classroom and what this looked like, um, the first aspect of this for me was reflecting on what it means to be a white teacher in a world history classroom. Um, so what does it mean also to be a white teacher teaching majority students of color? Um, and specifically at my school, we have a large international immigrant population. Um, so a lot of this history that we're talking about um, is something that has affected my students um, and something that has not affected me or my family or people that I am close to. Um, so on the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, something that we realized it's really easy to decenter yourself um, in the virtual classroom. Um, so the beginning of my class in my world history class, one of the things that I did was collect the stories um, of a multitude of um, voices and bring them into my classroom. So the women that are pictured um, here on the slide is um, Raquel is a young woman from the Philippines um, and Raven is a young um, black woman from, from Georgia. And so they were able to put their, their stories into my classroom and it was able, it was a moment for me to step back and center voices that were different than my own, especially um, as it applies to my students who have had very different experiences than me. Um, and this virtual space, though challenging at times, allowed for me to use something like Flipgrid, which I'm sure we're all familiar with, where students can use multimedia, which they're very comfortable with, um, as a way to interact with histories that may be a lot more similar to their own than mine is. Um, so in this specific platform that they were using, um, these students were able to watch these videos and then react to these videos by sharing their own story. Um, so for my specific platform, students had access to 10 videos um, with a, a myriad of experiences from each person. Um, and students watched um, as many as they wanted to and reacted to the one that they um, felt resonated with them the most. Um, so this gave students power in the classroom. This gave students an opportunity to see that um, history is not um, a, a singular experience and it is not a whitewashed experience like a lot of our curriculum is. Um, so this gave students also insight into the effects of history on human beings that may share a similar story to them and their families. We believe in the power of this storytelling as a way to decolonize um, our history curriculums and our classrooms. So instead of just sitting down with our textbooks and saying, this is what happened and it didn't really affect people. Instead, bringing people, bringing voices to the classroom that are saying, this is what happened and this is how it affected me. This is how it affected my family. Um, so like we talked about, using this history and a micro perspective um, where students can see the human impact, they can relate it back to themselves um, and they can apply that, that understanding to history and then to current events um, as they move forward in their own lives. And so what we really concluded from this and what we hope that our students did as well and think that they did is that history is truly personal. Um, I really talked about how individual storytelling and these these stories and these friends and people that we knew um, that we chose to tell stories in our classroom, um, in our virtual and digital classrooms, that these individual stories and this act of storytelling has significance on a macro level and that ultimately students and their micro histories and their own personal experiences and thoughts and opinions are just as much as part of history um, as anything else and that this importance of individual perspectives is relevant even on a macro scale for history. Mm -hmm. And this humanization um, is a part of the decolonization of curriculum. So understanding that um, the atrocities committed by um, groups of people and the wars that have gone on in history, these are not things that are just living in history books. These are things that are living and affecting us currently. Um, so this humanization is what we have seen um, as ways to decolonize our curriculum um, in a world where unfortunately a lot of our curriculum is still very colonized. And we just wanted to end our presentation on a, a positive note because despite all of the challenges that the pandemic and remote learning have presented, um, virtual learning has also been an unprecedented opportunity to include others in the classroom. I don't know that outside of a pandemic context, my nine friends that I um, had me make videos would have had time or an opportunity to be 
you know, creating these videos and to be as involved and to spend time after talking to my students and helping them with their research papers and really answer these big questions, um, as well as really presenting all of those things in a way that um, gave them an asynchronous or outside of class opportunity to engage with content and stories in a really significant way. Thank you. Wow, that was really inspiring. Thank you so much for your very important work teaching. We all owe everything to our teachers. So thank you for helping us build these bridges between our shared and unique histories. Um, I really appreciate that you are helping the next generation to learn in this way. And as you said, Anne, history is not a singular experience. So thank you. So before we move on to questions, I wanted to share uh, Laura Iremi's email so that uh, anyone who's interested in her work uh, can reach out to her. This is again uh, her presentation of a media representation of marginalized communities within uh, Romania, talking about fake news, stereotypes, ethnic discourse, and the challenges of the 2020 pandemic. So I'm going to post that in the chat here. Now we're going to open it up for questions. And I'd like to try and start with one uh, for each presenter. So if you guys could turn on your cameras, if you so, if you so wish, we'll put this in um, gallery mode so we can all see each other. So the first one, uh, I'm just gonna go start on for the Q&A. If um, we have some time, I have some questions of my own. And I'd also like to give the opportunity for the presenters to ask the other presenters questions because I'm sure we all have uh, an interest in each other's work. So uh, Dr. Hills, the first one is for you. Um, the attendee said, great presentation on telehealth trend. Are healthcare providers billing differently, lower, the same, or more than in-person care? And I am hoping for concise answers so that we can get, get to everybody. Thank you. Please unmute yourselves. Okay, there we go. Um, I can't speak for all professionals. I know physicians have two issues. Of course, reimbursement is one, and the other is are the, uh, are the uh, techniques being um, empirically validated. Uh, and I think as, as that um, evidence-based research becomes more available, we'll have answers. Now, the, a lot of these services are covered under the National Emergency Act. Now, I can speak toward my, what my, the work my uh, co-presenter is doing, and she was doing this prior to the pandemic and the reimbursement rates for the virtual mental health work she does is the same as a licensed independent social worker. So again, I can't speak to all disciplines. It's a good question though. Thank you. Our next one um, is I think for Jenna and Anne, um, the uh, attendee says, as an educator, I often come across a lot of reluctance that some students have to share their stories and personal narratives. How would you recommend tackling that? And I guess Olga too, if you'd like to talk about that um, or anyone else who has um, uh, insight. I will go ahead and answer that um, at first. So I think that it is hard to get students to open up in the classroom, but in my experience, um, both at the college level and I now teach elementary school Spanish, um, is that if you come into the classroom um, sharing your own stories and with a lot of vulnerability, that it really opens up um, that opportunity for students to be vulnerable and share their own stories as well, as well as really creating a classroom environment um, where your students feel comfortable saying those things. In my college classroom, um, I always made sure my students knew that we didn't have to agree or that they could have whatever opinion, whatever they wanted to say, um, and share as much or as little as they wanted. Personally, the assignment that I had them do with this storytelling um, that was in my presentation was um, I posted videos in Google Drive and then they emailed me personally their responses to those. And so I gave them an opportunity to be vulnerable with me and not necessarily have to share that with the rest of the class. Do any of you guys, uh, do it? Do we want anyone else's answer? Olga, you, you're yeah, unmuted. Uh, sure. Are you wanting to say something? Yeah, uh, yeah, like I mentioned in my presentation, what I found based on my experience doing my research back in the US, that 
Fulbrighters and professors seem to be more willing to participate. I think that's maybe has to do with level of maturity they have. Maybe they put themselves in my shoes, thinking that I'm doing research and at some point of their careers they had to do the same. But I found that everybody trying to explore the world and to try to pursue international careers, especially after maybe a third in their thirties or something, they seem to be more willing to share their stories and they're able to be more maybe open minded and they don't they aren't afraid of feeling vulnerable maybe while sharing these these stories. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I wanted to try and shift. We have a couple questions um, that you guys might be able to see in the chat for uh, Anne and Jenna. And I wanted to just make sure that I can um, give a chance to other presenters to um, also answer a couple questions. So I'm just going to scroll down uh, first here. So uh, Nancy Wright asks to the first presenter, is the low level of interest in the elderly among young health workers and students a result of uh, misperceptions of what elderly are like? Example, stereotyping, stigmatizing, or just a, a certainty that they do not want to work in a field, maybe as a result of the reality of age gap. And I, I guess that's um, for Dr. Hills, is that right? Uh, please unmute yourself. All right, and um, the we have problems recruiting because of misperceptions. I believe a lot of students feel that um, older people are all in nursing homes and they're all suffering cognitive decline. When the research shows that that's not the case, most older adults are doing fine. They're living in the community independently of you know care, um, and so we so it's an education battle to try to get students interested. And after my classes, students typically say, wow, I never really thought much about older adults, except right through that example of the fellow down the street. It may not apply to their grandparents or people that they know personally, but they can always point to someone and say, oh yes, you see that that's what happens when you get old. And so we, so we work a lot on misperceptions and dispelling myths. And when we can do that, and then get students actually in settings where they're working with older adults, we have a, a much better chance of recruiting through that. So, but yes, that it, that's an ongoing issue um, because of, I, I just believe it's misperceptions, what it means to get older. Wonderful, um, thank you. So I actually have a question for Mike, if, if that's okay. Um, so I'm curious, you know, you worked with these, um, these schools in India and obviously you had a lot of uh, different um, kind of art projects. Was there one in particular that stood out to you where you got to kind of integrate all the color that you were talking about? Something that stuck out to you from your experience before you had to come back? Uh, yeah, the, uh, so when I was in Aligarh, uh, I was with uh, Aligarh Muslim University for about a week I was there. At, at the same time I was with uh, Ibn Sina. And I did a workshop with the the uh, painting bachelor students there, and uh, we did what's called an exquisite corpse, where you fold up a sheet of paper and it's hidden, and everybody has to draw on it. And so we did these really large ones, and uh, it was a lot of fun to see like uh, the collaboration between everybody. And so yeah, that was really great. That's pretty interesting. Do you guys, do you have like a website where you're putting all of this or maybe like you could do what Olga's suggesting and do it like a blog or something. You just have like very visual, you know, output. I think it would be super interesting for us all to see. Sure, I have a website. It, doesn't, it has just like my, my own personal work on it and it's mikebenevenia.com. And then my Instagram also has a lot of images on that. And that's again, my name, it's just Mike Benevenia. Would you mind putting that in the chat for us sure. too? That'd be great, thank you. So we have uh, another question for um, Anne and Jenna. So this one is from uh, Lin Shi. The work you both have done to center different voices for your students to humanize history is really fantastic and inspiring. Could you please share what platform you used for the videos? This is a beautiful idea. Yeah, so um, something that I've used and been really successful with is a website called Flipgrid. 
Um, and with this platform, students can react to specific videos. So say you create a topic. Um, so I created the topic of decolonizing history. Um, and the students could go through and they could watch all of them um, or as many as they wanted to and then respond with their own videos. Um, so they were able to mimic the storytelling, mimic um, the ways that you know people who are in their 20s and 30s are talking um, and share their own stories. So it gives them a lot of um, autonomy and also they're very used to, they sit on their phones and record themselves, which they do all the time. Um, so it gives them a lot of autonomy and it's a platform that they're very comfortable with and it really mimics social media in that way. It really does. And I think Flipgrid is an amazing classroom tool. And I used Google Drive. Um, I had all my speakers send me videos and I uploaded them to a Google folder. And I did that because my students are older and they have a very high level of Spanish and I wanted to make sure there was some linguistic work um, going on that was more than just listening and speaking, but some writing as well, um, which Flipgrid doesn't give quite the opportunity for that. Um, and so I just use Google Drive. That's very interesting, thank you. Um, so, so I have a question for uh, Dr. Neil Hubin. Um, is he still with us? Oh, I guess he had to drop off. Okay, well, I'll message him uh, later. So we have um, a couple more minutes. Uh, I wanted to ask one more follow-up question for Jenna and uh, Anne, given that uh, we still have some in the chat. And then I have a couple of questions and I would love to open it up so that you guys can ask questions um, to each other. So uh, uh, Catherine Mahood says, uh, Anne and Jenna, what a great way to bring cross-cultural perspectives to your students. Have you been able to reach out to other teachers to share your use of social media to bring in other voices to the classrooms? Um, yeah, this is a really good question. And um, I would say specifically, I just graduated from a master's of education program um, and I have a large education educator community um, so we're always sharing these resources with one another and Jenna and myself as well. Um, and gaining permission from our friends who we have. So, you know, if we're talking about the colonizations of the Philippines, for example, um, and one of my educator friends knows that I know someone who could provide perspective on that. Um, it's a community that we have of other people who are working together to find those voices, um, to share those perspectives. Because um, there's a lot of nuance in these communities. So the, the experience of a Black woman from the South could be completely different from an Indigenous African woman um, who's trying to provide her, her experiences. Um, so yes, we definitely use social media. We get the kids engaged on social media too. Um, and we try to make this as global of a conversation as possible. Wonderful. Um, so I have one other follow-up question for Olga and Mike. Um, are there social media sites that you guys feel, you know, are effectively used for art and blogging? I've used uh, WordPress in the past to make my blogs. Um, I've shared uh, artwork that I've done on, on that, but I'm, I'm not familiar with what has been trending and what's been effective. Yeah, so Mike and Olga, whoever would like to, to address the question. See, just a few words. Actually, to be honest, I'm not so technology savvy, but what I found is that WordPress is still a huge thing. So a lot of people actually, I also three WordPress blogs. So I have my personal blog, travel blog. So I think that seems to be one of the most Honestly, in our country, in Russia, Instagram is so huge. So it, literally everybody's using that for all kinds of purposes. And I think now we, it's gaining momentum in the rest of the world as well. Mike said he's having internet issues, but I, I see you here. Do you want to take a stab at that question? If not, we can come back to you. OK. We'll come back to you. So um, this question is for Dr. Hills. Um, Catherine Mahood says, due to the pandemic, we have a whole generation of young people who are struggling with mental health issues. Schools and universities were able 
to provide some services pre-COVID-19, are you aware of any movement in the med medical community to reach young people and provide them with services using the online services that works with schools and universities? At my university, we have a very active counseling center and it's been providing, there's been an uptick in service provision prior to the pandemic and then even during the pandemic, um, the numbers aren't what they were prior to, but then we don't have as many people on campus. Um, many of our students are continuing to stream and we worry about those students because they are isolated. Um, but I, yes, there is a tremendous emphasis on this. Uh, American Psychological Association, for example, is very actively engaged in trying to reach out and, and they release warnings and notices for people to, to be on the alert. But I don't think we're really gonna know I don't think we're really going to know the impact of this in terms of mental health. That's my personal view until after it's all over. And unfortunately, um, there has been enough, you know, the numbers are, are increasing in a lot of, um, in, in the incidence of every, every type of mental health issue, anxiety disorder, depression, uh, domestic issues. Um, so unfortunately, you know, the isolation has, has exacerbated a lot of the pre-existing issues. Um, but unfortunately, this is gonna be one of the issues I think that's gonna play out and be a sad story when it's all over. Uh, okay, I'll, thank you. I, I would like to say one of the, I'm always optimistic. And so I, I, I agree there are unexpected opportunities from this as well. And we'll learn through this what has worked and what hasn't worked and we'll carry these lessons forward and maybe be able to provide better, better mental health services and better ways to reach out to people in the future. So that if we ever do have something like this again, we'll be better prepared and, and maybe better able to offset yeah. some of the difficulties. I, I, I appreciate your optimism. I share that hope. Um, so we have one more question from Nancy Wright for uh, Anne and Jenna, and uh, I'd like to try and see if you can answer it quickly so that we can open it up to have a, a small closing statement um, and answer any questions you guys have. So could you share a specific example of enhanced cultural understanding among either Spain or U.S. students as a result of your project? I can definitely do that. Um, so I had my Spanish civilization university level students write research papers, um, which were due a few weeks after I did this um, speaker day where I had invited speakers and had them watch the videos and react to them. And so um, quite a few of them actually ended up using the um, speakers that they spoke with and had interviews with in their research papers um, and changing some of the things that they, they had thought about and focused on. Um, gender violence in Spain is a problem. Um, and I had students who were writing on it and then chose to change it to be contextualized a little more specifically um, with the COVID-19 pandemic because I had a therapist from Spain as one of my um, invited speakers who talked about how women specifically were being impacted by gender violence during the COVID-19 pandemic in Spain and what that specifically looked like. Um, and that also happened for them in a political context. Um, I had a speaker speak about Vox, um, which is a far-right political party in Spain. Um, and my students also in, had interviews with that speaker and used that new knowledge in their papers, um, as well as chose to pursue research opportunities virtually this summer um, and continuing that research on um, the rise of the alt-right party in Spain. That's very interesting. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Um, we only have about a minute. So um, if you guys have any itching questions between yourselves, please ask. Um, I'll give you guys a couple minutes. You also have each other's uh, information. Okay, great. So we'll, we'll just close here. Um, thank you to all the presenters. I know I learned a tremendous amount and uh, please feel free to share your experience uh, uh, from this poster session and also, of course, about the rest of the conference uh, on your favorite social media network using the hashtag world go from here. Um, I'd like to close now and um, thank you all for attending.